<clears throat> so before we can even delve into the death penalty and how it works, we need to start by thinking about punishment in general and why do we punish? So why do we want to punish people who break the law? And more interestingly, why is the impulse to punish so strong? And then, of course, how do we justify punishment? Um, and we've talked about those philosophies of punishment in a variety of courses. One thing to keep in mind in terms of the death penalty is that this is a moral debate, okay? And then you also need to know that the foundation for morality is more emotional than rational. Now, we can't discuss capital punishment without thinking about the role of religion. So the holy books of the world's major religions consistently support the death penalty for people who violate collective morality. Now, recall from sociology that religion is vital to reinforcing social norms, right? So when we think about something from the social functionalist perspective, that's one of the functions that religion plays, to reinforce social norms. Now, we often think of emotion and rationality as being opposites, but really they're um, not two inseparable components of what we think and do. So we can look at both of these processes in our brains by using brain imaging, okay? And when we do this, we can see that emotion and cognition are fully physically integrated in areas of the brain that weigh both rational and emotional information, and then travel from their respective regions of the brain to guide our actual behavior. Now, in terms of evolution, emotion clearly precedes rationality, and rational abilities are gradually added to those pre-existing and also simultaneously developing emotional capacities. So think back to Durkheim. Right? Durkheim says that crime is a necessary um, part of society, that we won't ever get rid of it, and that it serves a vital so social function. And it serves that vital social function by punishing cr criminals. When we punish criminals, we're reinforcing our social and moral boundaries. And it also reinforces our attachment to those boundaries. So the purpose of punishment, according to Durkheim, is not to deter future bad behavior, but it strengthens social solidarity by the group um, when they express moral outrage. That's also reinforced by the religious idea that crime is an affront to both God and man. And Durkheim says this is basically an unappreciated function of punishment, that punishment maintains social solidarity by reinforcing the justness of social norms. So when we punish people for their crimes, we're assigning moral responsibility to them. The blame for their behavior is in their flawed character, and it's not due to external circumstances. Those who most strongly uphold morality preached by their religion, those who see it as a fundamental truth, are most likely to support the death penalty. So when we look at this, when we study the relationship between the death penalty and religion, if we look at it simply as who goes to church and who doesn't go to church, we, we don't see much difference there. The majority of both groups support the death penalty. However, Christians who believe in a wrathful, punitive God, the God that we see in the Old Testament, they are much more likely to support the death penalty than those who think of God as a personal, loving God. So recall that retribution is the idea that punishment is justly deserved for its own sake and that we don't have to justify it any further than that. Now, we know that the urge to punish is universal and strong. Punishment, then, must have played a role in helping our ancestors survive and pass on their genes. So again, let's come back to these brain imaging studies. They show that there is increased blood flow to the nucleus acumens when a subject witnesses the punishment of someone who has wronged them. The strength of the pleasure response is also proportional to how much harm was done and how culpable that offender is. So we do see a biological process happening there. Now, social animals like humans cooperate with each other because we can achieve more as a group than we can individually. And we also feel good about ourselves when we help others and our brain receives a nice little shot of dopamine. Victims feel angry and hurt if they're treated unfairly, and they often feel confusion and frustration because the expectation of predictable behavior amongst members of the group has disappeared. What does this lead to? This leads to moral outrage. Now, it's not always possible for us to directly punish the person who has harmed us. And in fact, when we think about um, the criminal justice system, we are not the ones carrying out punishment. 
So amongst primates, the alpha takes on the role of controlling behavior, and that includes punishment of troop members who bully and exploit others. So alpha males typically show a preference for the weaker party in most disputes, and this helps them develop support amongst the weaker rank and allows the high and levels the hierarchy between that alpha male and those who might seek to replace him. Now studies show that punishers receive many benefits. One is the increased likelihood of receiving future benefits. And most importantly, they receive enhanced status within the group. Now, in human groups, as I mentioned, punishment is meted out by a third party, right? Person who doesn't benefit directly and is not the person who's directly harmed. Now, in all populations, people are willing to punish defectors who have harmed unknown others. And societies with high degrees of punishment will exhibit more altruistic behavior. So, we know blood flows to the pleasure center of the brain when we witness the punishment of someone who has harmed us. And we also know that that reaction is proportional to how culpable that offender is. So the more pleasure is experienced by the person being imaged, if the punished offender purposely inflicted harm, as opposed to it being done um, inadvertently. Now, punishment that exceeds any sort of just and reasonable boundaries induces disgust, Okay except for sadists. We want to remember, though, just because our feelings are natural doesn't mean we should act on them. So just because we gain pleasure from punishment doesn't mean we should always act on that. Now, during Beccaria's time, 1738 to 1794, brutal acts of retribution were pretty common. And recall that Beccaria calls for a whole host of reforms in the criminal justice system. Now, the retribution is often based on vengeance requirements of powerful aristocrats. And this results in general distrust rather than altruistic cooperation. Now, Durkheim notes that many societies have moved from this retributive type of justice to what he calls a restitutive justice. Now, restitutive justice is driven by simple deterrence. It's more humanistic and it's more tolerant. So the goal here is to prevent bad behavior. So what do we know about human nature and punishment? Okay, well, our earliest schools of thought come from the classical school of thought, and it deals extensively with free will, okay? Most of us believe, or like to believe, that we are the masters of our own lives. Now, in the classical school of thought, um, hedonism is the goal that we are pursuing, okay? And that is the idea that happiness is the ultimate goal. Every other goal we're achieving is a means of achieving happiness. Now, when we talk about happiness, we're talking about living the kind of life that provides the most pleasure, tranquility and peace of mind. So where does rational behavior come in? This is the behavior that has a logical fit between that goal we're trying to achieve, happiness, and how we're going to go ahead and achieve that. So the goals of human rationality is to serve that hedonistic self-interest. This leads to what we call the hedonistic calculus. And this is the way what we basically weigh um, anticipated benefits against possible costs. And if the benefits outweigh the costs, um, then that is thought to enhance pleasure and minimize pain. That's the behavior we pursue. Free will basically means that we purposely and deliberately choose a calculated course of action. So free will and determinism are compatible, okay? We're free to do what we want unless we're constrained by our circumstances. Now, when philosophers speak of agency, they're talking about this kind of constrained free will. Agency recognizes constraints on our ability to do what we please, but also acknowledges that we're morally obligated to act responsibly. Now, the law recognizes that behavior is also determined by things that are outside of our control. And we do that by looking at what we call mitigating circumstances when we determine someone's punishment. The law also recognizes that most defendants are minimally rational have the ability to know the difference between the right and wrong, and the ability to resist acting on the impulses that are contrary to a civilized society. So utilitarianism says an action is morally right if it produces the most utility for the greatest number of people. So when we think about punishment, it means that the beneficial consequences of punishment have to justify its application. Punishment becomes a means to an end. It's a consequential consequentialist approach. Retribution is non-consequentialist. It says punishment is just derived from its intrinsic moral worth. It doesn't matter what benefits derive from it. 
Now, deterrence is a primary function of punishment, and it's one of the primary justifications used for the death penalty. It assumes that many more people would break the law if not for that fear of punishment. Now, incapacitation is the idea that criminals are unable to victimize people when they're incarcerated. Well, they're unable to victimize anybody outside of prison. Now, when we look at um, people whose sentences were commuted um, when um, various death penalty rulings happened, we could not conclude that their executions would have protected or benefited society. So incapacitation works, but life without parole would provide the same effect. Now, in terms of rehabilitation, this means to restore or return to constructive or healthy activity. Now, life without parole, parole removes any emphasis on rehabilitation because we're not going to return that person to society. Rehabilitation's goal is to change someone's attitude so that they believe that their behavior was wrong. The goal is not to deter by threat of future punishment. Now, reintegration is a little bit more pragmatic than rehabilitation. It's just basically preparing someone to re-enter society. So it focuses on things like job training as opposed to changing someone's attitude. Now, retribution looks backwards. Okay? It's punishment for its own sake is morally justified. Now, let's think about Kant. And those of you that have taken ethics should remember Kant. Um, Kant talks about categorical imperatives. Today, capital punishment is justified and the Supreme Court has upheld both of these justifications in terms of deterrence and retribution. To understand um, what Kant is talking about here, we have to think about his idea of duty. We have a duty to act out of reverence for moral law. Moral law, then, is a set of categorical imperatives, behavior that is required of everybody. Categorical imperative is a principle stating that an act should be done in itself regardless of any further end. So punishing criminals for deterrence or subjecting them to rehabilitation is morally wrong, according to Kant, because it uses them as a means to an end. By punishing criminals, the state is treating them according to their own maxims, how they think others should be treated. The state is thus allowing criminals to decide how they will be treated, and by doing so, it is respect of their, respective of their judgment and autonomy. Now, retribution restores a balance, okay? When someone has broken the law, they've received an unjust profit or gain, and that needs to be redressed or annulled. So the retributionist isn't hitting, but rather hitting back. We also know that this urge to punish can be seen as loyalty to the group and an expression of commitment to that group. Now, one way we can look at this is by looking at game theory, okay? Game theory finds that a measure of forgiveness works better to maintain social cooperation when someone cheats, okay? So as opposed to always paying them back in kind. If we always punish people when they don't cooperate, we risk losing valuable relationships, especially if their cheating behavior was uncharacteristic of them or accidental. A forgiveness strategy is like sentencing a first-time offender to probation as opposed to prison. It gives them a chance to redeem themselves and leaves the door open to futurely, future mutually advantageous cooper cooperation. And now, as we close out this chapter, we see here we have a table. It's really just comparing um, and summarizing for you the different elements of different justifications for punishment. So across the top, we have retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, rehabilitation, and reintegration. And along the side, how those things are justified, um, their strategy for punishment, their focus of punishment, and how we see criminals. And that wraps up this chapter.